All right, our last storyteller of the evening um, took up storytelling about two years ago when he realized he was full of interesting stories and he just had to share them. Um, he is also on the board of the Storytelling Association of California, and he would love it if you came up to him after the show to ask him all about it. Everyone, please welcome Rick Roberts. Simply stated, I needed help. By the time I was 12 years old, I was painfully introverted and deeply hurt inside because of earlier traumas. At three years old, my father was arrested. It was during the Red Scare, the early 50s, the McCarthy era. And although he only spent a month in jail, it took six years before his case was thrown out of court. And we lived under the specter of my dad going to prison for the rest of his life during those six years. And then I was raped in the park near our house in Philadelphia when I was nine. And when I ran away from that rapist after the rape, he yelled, you better not tell anyone, I'll find you. I kept it a secret, I closed it up inside, and I closed in on myself. Now you would think that maybe I would be able to heal at that point, but our family wasn't a normal family. My mom at that point went all in new age on us. She began her own me first movement. Yeah. <laughs> not the me too movement, although <laughs> she was a feminist. It was the Me First movement. She began to put her whims and wishes ahead of everything else, including her family. The first thing she did was drag us to a nudist camp. <laughs> now, I was in puberty, so you can imagine what I felt about that. <laughs> and then she met this guy at, at the nudist camp, the president of the American Sunbathing Association, no less, <laughs> from California, of course. <laughs> And he turned her on to LSD. And a few years later, she left my dad, and she took me to South Pasadena to live with her and the naked acid head. <laughs> now, I hated South Pasadena. I hated my high school. I really hated the naked acid head. And I didn't want to spend any time with my mom anymore, either. The home that they had was not my home. And even though I had become closed in on myself, I needed to go out in the world alone on my own. It was 1967, so I went to the Haight-Ashbury. Mm -hmm. That's where I met Bobby Smith, and Bobby Smith became a brother to me. Bobby had Portuguese, Hawaiian, Native American, and African American blood, and a bronze afro. And everything Bobby did in his life was celebration and art. He drew fantastic psychedelic posters. And as a kid, I had been artistic, and I took up painting and drawing again. And Bobby would give me advice and praise. Ricky, I like that one. Or Ricky, how about a bolder line over here on that one? You know, a true mentor. And unlike the rest of us who wore faded denim, Bobby and his flamboyant gay friends wore outrageous costumes put together from thrift stores. And although they did call it the summer of love, I was so shy, I wouldn't even talk to the girls that I liked. And Bobby knew that, so he pushed me, sometimes with his hand in my back. So I had to go up and talk to them. And one evening, he just took matters into his own hands. He mysteriously took me to a house and knocked on the door. And Phaedra answered it. Now, I knew Phaedra, tall, long black hair, cowboy boots, but only because we'd been locking eyes on Haight Street or at the Fillmore Auditorium dance floor. I had never had the guts to talk to her. She hung out with the Haight-Ashbury rock bands, Janis Joplin and people like that. She was way out of my league. Now, Bobby knew Phaedra too, obviously, because he set this thing up. And that night, Phaedra smiled at me, took my hand, and led me straight to her bedroom where she immediately consulted the ancient Chinese oracle book, the I Ching. <laughs> and Confucius must have given me a thumbs up because I spent that night with Phaedra and quite a few more after that. I was beginning to come out of my shell. But sometimes I still needed a protector. Like one night, a bunch of us went to Santa Cruz to visit friends. 
and beds were scarce. So Bobby, this guy named Fernando, and I slept in an old school bus. And during the night, Fernando's hand must have gone over Bobby towards me because I woke up when Bobby sat bolt upright and I saw him putting Fernando's hand back where it belonged. And then he scolded Fernando, Fernando, Ricky's straight. And if that ever changes, it'll be me, not you. So leave him alone. Well, in those days, one thing led to another very quickly. And in 1969, Bobby was arrested as an accessory to a car theft. It seems that a few years earlier, he had gotten a ride across country in a stolen car. So I collected cash from our friends, and I went and bailed him out. And when I bailed him out, I found out that his name was not Smith. His name was Holcomb. And Bobby Holcomb skipped bail and left for Europe. And before long, I lost track of him. I grew up. I got married, I had kids, but any time that my confidence wavered, I pictured Bobby behind me and I could feel his hand at my back. And then in 1991, I heard this Jimmy Buffett song and it had this great island vibe to it and these lyrics. There's this one particular harbor so near yet so far away and it was co-written with Bobby Holcomb. And just two days later, I heard a radio disc jockey who had just gotten back from Tahiti raving about Bobby, the hottest music in Tahiti. And when he played it, and when I heard the voice, I knew it was my friend Bobby. These were definitely signs, and I needed to get a hold of him. So I called the radio station, and I got the address of the record label, and I wrote to them, and I asked them if they could put me in touch with Bobby. They sent me Bobby's CD, which was beautifully illustrated with Bobby's exquisite paintings of islanders and island myths. And the songs in Tahitian, French, and English were joyful odes to island life, many of them backed up by a chorus of Tahitian children. Along with the CD was a short but sympathetic letter telling me that Bobby had died just a few weeks earlier. But all I had of Bobby was the CD in my hands and the person that I had become with his help. So I needed to learn more. And one amazing thing led to another. Here's what I learned. Bobby moved to Tahiti in 1976, and he immersed his art and his music in the Polynesian culture and then he taught that culture to the children of Tahiti through his art and his music. He was declared a national treasure for his mentoring of the Tahitian youth. And on the 10th and 20th anniversaries of Bobby's death, Tahiti issued postage stamps with Bobby's paintings to commemorate his life. So Bobby had become my big brother exactly when I needed one. And then he became the big brother to an entire island nation. In 16 months, I'll be going to Tahiti. They'll be holding the 30th anniversary of Bobby's death, celebrating Bobby's life. I'll be there with thousands of my brothers and sisters at the base of the sacred volcano where Bobby is buried. So I've learned a little Tahitian for the occasion. Mururu, ata, tahia. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you.